Okay. Hello, Stephen. Good afternoon. Hello, Johnny. I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm, thank God, fine. Allow me to introduce you to our audience who are watching. Uh, yes. This is Professor Stephen Brecker, who, apart from being a personal friend and a uh, very special member of St. John's Wood community, Stephen is a world-renowned, uh, eminent doctor and head of cardiology at St. George's Hospital in London. And we are very grateful that you have found a few minutes in the middle of your very busy schedule to just do a Zoom call with us to share some information with the community about what's actually going on at the moment. So yes. uh, if I could ask you just to tell us a little bit about how you are doing and what's happening. So uh, as everyone knows, um, we're in the midst of a very rapid rising phase of the coronavirus pandemic. And it's affecting London more severely than every, anywhere else in the country at the moment, but it's likely other cities will follow. Um, it's obviously a very difficult and distressing time for everybody, but there are many positives actually coming out from what, what's happening at the moment. I only know firsthand what's happening at my own hospital, and we've been preparing for at least two to three weeks for where we are now. And there are two sides to it. The first is that we've stopped almost all non-urgent, non-emergency activity, and that includes in cardiology. Um, so all elective procedures are cancelled. Um, and that and all outpatient appointments have been cancelled. I've I've been doing virtual clinic, so telephoning patients. And uh, that's from that's that's meant the rest of the hospital has been very quiet. However, um, obviously we have a large number of coronavirus patients in the hospital. Now, as a cardiologist, um, we do have a role in looking after these patients, but my role has been predominantly administrative and uh, supervising a lot of the other doctors and helping to plan. We've got um, normally at St. George's, we have an intensive care unit capacity of something like 60 to 70 patients. And that's on a cardiac ITU, a neurological neurosurgery intensive care unit and a general intensive care unit. And we've got the ability at, as we sit here today to take about 110 patients. Right. By almost, almost double capacity. Yeah, having converted a lot of other spaces. So we've made uh, the empty operating theatres because we're not doing hip replacements or anything like that. So those operating theatres have ventilators in them and we're putting patients, if we need to, into those. Right. And um, so we'll have, we've, as we sit here today, we actually have spare capacity at our hospital at the moment, we have about something like 60 patients who are being ventilated, and we've got 40 beds of intensive care unit mm. facility open, and we're opening more each day. Right. So there, <clears throat> each hospital has got, has got to have the ability to what's called surge to greater numbers, and, and, that, and we, we are going to get many more patients, and we'll have the ability to do that. I assume you're anticipating in the coming days, unfortunately, those beds will, will fill up. Um, my question to yes. you really is, in terms of prioritizing and triaging pa patients, how do you categorize and decide who gets the ventilator and who doesn't? Obviously, there are many people who are affected by this COVID-19, this terrible virus, and how does the hospital make those very difficult life and death decisions? So you're talking about triage, and although people think that may only happen in a war situation, in fact, intensive care units have always triaged patients in that it's, it's always, there's always been an assessment of what the likelihood of recovery is. Um, we've already learned quite a lot from China and Italy about what types of patients are going to recover and which ones are not. And the ones that are very, the patients who are very unlikely to recover are those who've already been told to self-isolate weeks, you know, two weeks ago. So it's, it's the, the patients who are very elderly with multiple other conditions. Those, those patients will probably not 
if they were to require intensive care, they probably would, would the chances of recovery are very small. <clears throat> now, some, some hospitals in Italy have had to have an age cut off, such that they won't take anyone over a certain age onto an intensive care unit. At the moment in the UK, there is, as I say, that it, and in London, there is still capacity, but there will be some various uh, risk assessments done on patients, even in the emergency department, to assess what quality of life is like, what frailty, what their frailty is like, and how likely it is they're going to be able to manage if they, if, even if they did recover from an intensive care unit admission. And most patients who, with this disease who go on to an intensive care unit need to be there for about two weeks. That's, that's the kind of recovery time on the intensive care unit. And we are having patients who've already been there two weeks and are coming off ventilators and thank God going home. That must be very encouraging to see. Um... Another question I have for you is, what advice do you have for family members? Obviously, there are loved ones who are in the hospital. I understand most of the hospitals are not admitting any visitation at all at this time. And it's very yeah. painful for loved ones at home not to be able to have that contact. Do you have any advice for, for those people at home? So the first, thing is to, the first thing is that they should look at that not as a penalty, but as a, um, if you like, almost like a blessing that they're being protected from going in they don't, if, if they had worries about going in and picking up the infection, the fact that the decision is taken out of their hands is in many ways they should be comforted by that. My own hospital is not allowing any visitors at the moment and, um, or very, very limited. And the reason is that we have to reduce the number of people coming into the buildings because of the possibility of cross infection. and. Um, obviously, if, if patients are well enough to um, speak on the phone or even do WhatsApp calls or Zoom calls like this, then they will. And, and we've got wards full of patients who are sitting there quite happily chatting to their relatives uh, on these sorts of social media and, and, right. and they're able to keep connected. But I think relatives should see it as something like the decision is out of their hands they shouldn't feel guilty about not going they're simply not allowed and the reason they're not allowed is because they could pick up the infection and carrying it carry it outside so sure. they by sitting at home and, and doing this type of communication they are saving lives sure and Stephen being the head of the department and responsible for so many other doctors um, do you feel that the NHS provided enough gear for everybody well, this has been a really difficult issue and I mean I think there will be many many questions to ask when this is all over. No country in the world has been prepared for this and sure. I, d I don't think the UK is better or worse than anywhere else. Um, there isn't enough of the highest level of personal protection equipment, that's the visors, the long gloves, the gowns, and so the lower level of personal protection is what is what is being used in in cases where there is there is what's where there is not this aerosol producing uh, procedure. So procedures that produce an aerosol mm. when you uh, can transmit the virus, then the lower level of personal protection equipment is used. Um, it's been very difficult because every staff member has responded in a different way to this. And we've, all, we've already had two of uh, my colleagues who've been off sick with this. Uh, they, thank God, they're, they're better. One of them is back at work. But there are, there are others who are, are still off, not in this hospital, but there's plenty of doctors who are off. Whether personal protection equipment is the key to this, I don't know. I think there's gonna be a lot of questions at the end of all of this to ask. But remember, the way I've looked upon this is this, this disease is non-discriminatory. Non it, um, it doesn't exclude doctors. You know, doctors, lawyers, bankers, cleaners, doctors, everyone. Royalty to rabbis and, and everyone in between. <laughs> Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Stephen, one final question and then I'll let you get back. Um, just do you have any closing message to 
members of our community, people who are self-isolating or finding this time very stressful and challenging, any short piece of advice or message to everyone? I don't know. I don't know that I'm any better at it than anyone else. I'm not at work every day. There are days where I'm, ha I'm at home as well uh, because we want to reduce the number of people in the hospital. Um, you've just got to pace yourself, take it easy, try and do some things that you may have been thinking you've wanted to do for years but never had the time. Um, and just try and look at the end, look at, look at where this will go. And it will be, it, thank God, at the end of this, it will be uh, a successful outcome in that we will minimize the number of deaths if we possibly can. And we will learn a lot from this. And there's many, many positive things have come out of it. And, and, and the message, I guess, to people is to try and remain positive, however difficult it is. Try and remain in contact with people. And uh, we're in a more connected world than ever before. And we still can do that. Uh, try and get out once a day. I think getting out into the fresh air once a day is still a good thing. Uh, not You don't have to go very far just for a walk keeping social distance and just just don't try and look just take it one day at a time uh, that's the message one day at a you time know, last Thursday night we stood on our doorstep and we clapped for the NHS and on behalf of everyone in the community we clap to you and we, we we thank you from the bottom of our heart for everything you are doing please stay safe stay healthy and we look forward to seeing you in the synagogue very very soon I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Best. All the best. Thanks a lot. Take care, Yoni.